Coming up, learn the history behind St. Valentine's Day and grateful parents share why this day holds special meaning for them and their daughter. Welcome to 700 Club Canada and happy Valentine's Day. Whether it's your favorite box of chocolates today or a special note to someone you love, I hope that this is a day that reminds you of the power of love. Do you know that according to psychology today, love is as critical for your mind and body as oxygen. Isn't that incredible? It's actually not negotiable. The more connected you are, the healthier you will be both physically and emotionally. And the less connected you are, the more you're at risk, wow. It's also true that the less love you have, the more depression you're likely to experience in your life. Love is probably the best antidepressant there is because one of the most common sources of depression is feeling unloved. I just wanna to say to you right off the top today, you are loved. So receive that today and show some love to others around you. What does Valentine's Day mean to you? Well, maybe this will help. This is the history behind St. Valentine's Day. For many people, Valentine's Day is all about romance. If you may ask the person in the street, what does Valentine's Day mean to you? All it means is heart-shaped boxes of chocolates and a nice dinner with your, with your beloved and, and sending cards and so forth. And then if they did know about a St. Valentine, they probably wouldn't realize that he was a priest in the late third century in Rome who was actually martyred for the faith. Very often, legends will develop from real facts. There's that little phrase in, in J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings where he says, uh, history became legend and legend became myth. The legend of St. Valentine is a story that is rooted in fact. There are three stories surrounding him, and they all agree on a number of issues. It seemed that he was born in 226 in a tiny little city called Terni in Umbria in Italy, and that he was either a priest or a bishop. Valentine apparently lived during the reign of the Emperor Claudius II. He's sometimes referred to as Claudius Gothicus. Now, this emperor did not reign for very long, maybe a year and a half. Rome at this point in time was really a cesspool of immoral behavior. Pedophilia was rife, sexual promiscuity was rife, and, and one of the great witnesses of the early church is that they stood up for the value of a godly marriage where uh, sexuality was channeled into its God-given um, boundaries and it would become a witness of what enduring love could look like. During his reign, Claudius issued an edict that made marriage illegal. There was an invasion of Goths towards Rome, and they needed a lot of people to go to war. And it seemed that the rule was that once you were married, you were given freedom not to go to war. And um, Valentine would not only convert the people, but secretly marry them so that they could indeed stay at home. Valentine was arrested and brought to Rome. While he was being held captive, he presented the gospel to his jailer, the judge Asterius. So the judge said to him, well, if this indeed is true, I want you to prove it. And he brought one of his adopted daughters who happened to be blind, the one legend says. And what happened is that Valentinus, or Valentine here, laid his hands upon this girl and she was healed immediately. Another legend says that before he was executed, he left a note for the girl signed, Your Valentine. Some say this led to the practice of sending Valentines on February 14th, the day he was beheaded. All the legends seem to agree that uh, Valentine was martyred on the 14th of February in 269. Therefore, that was the day associated with him when the church would celebrate and, and thank God for his life. So Valentine's Day didn't start out as a romantic holiday. We do need to recognize that this day, the 14th of February, was already connected with Valentine from the fourth century, already from that time onward. And right from the beginning, this celebration had more to do 
than just a celebration of romantic love. And the church's commitment to Valentine to honor this example of Christian marriage and sacrifice and martyrdom and the healing of other people and the spread of the gospel was from the beginning a commitment to what Christian marriage could be like in our world and the message that it brings to a broken world. Valentine's Day represents more than flowers and candy. It's about what's in our hearts and the heart of Christ. When we see those hearts on Valentine's Day, we can remember that that heart is, also has some connections back to the heart of Jesus and to God's love for us. And we can remember that the source of all love and the source of self-sacrifice and, and love for each other is rooted in God's love uh, and, in the, and in the witness that St. Valentine actually made for that love. For Christians, marriage is more than just a union between a man and a woman. For Christians, marriage is a holy parable of the love of Christ towards His church. It's a visible sermon about what holiness and purity could look like in our lives. We should celebrate what true sacrificial love looks like in a broken world. And ultimately, it should be a day that we celebrate the commitment of Christ who gave His life for His church. It should be a day of evangelism. It should be a day where we celebrate the power of true love to change our world. It is a Christian holiday. Wow, I don't know about you, but I just learned a ton about Valentine's Day. Isn't that fascinating? The history of it and the richness of it. I mean, it's more than a box of chocolates. I love what he said when he said, marriage is a holy parable of the love of Christ towards his church. See, a parable really is a picture. And marriage needs to be a picture of what true love looks like. I do think we've diminished and lost the meaning of Valentine's Day on many levels. What if we were to look at it from its origins, like we were just reminded, how would that change how we celebrate? You know, Valentine's Day is a Christian holiday. It's a, actually a day of evangelism. Don't you love that? It's a celebration of the power of true love to change the world. And don't we need that message more than anything else today? See, we've lost the value of true love and the importance of a committed marriage covenant. And marriage really is a picture of the gospel. It's a demonstration of sacrificial love. You know, God reminds us in his word in 1 John 3, 16, what love is. It says this, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. I mean, there we have it so clearly that Jesus said love is sacrificial. Love isn't about just getting your own way. Again, I think this is a message for us in our time more than ever. If you need more encouragement or help in your life in regards to how to love, we have a resource simply called Love. Give us a call at 1-855-759-0700. And we're here for you. We want to pray with you and encourage you, no matter what you're facing, helping you live a life out of love. Well, now here is psychotherapist and life coach Andrew Blackwood with tips for building a healthy mindset. Life can be so busy filled with responsibilities, concerns, worries, things we can't control, like the loss of a loved one. I recently attended the funeral of a childhood family friend of mine, and as I stood there watching them lower her casket into the ground, all I could remember was her face, her sweet, gentle way as a child, and my heart ached, literally. But there was one consolation. I knew that I would see her again. Whether you're a new believer or a seasoned follower of Christ, once you've heard and accepted the invitation to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, an opportunity for more became available to you. Your eyes, your ears, your heart, your soul, your spirit becomes awake, awake to a beautiful truth that everything temporal is temporary. And we actually have access to eternity with Christ. So, in Colossians 3, verse 2, we're invited to set our affections, set our minds on things that are above. The New Living Translation says it this way, Let heaven fill your thoughts. 
do not think only about the things down here on Earth. Now, how is that even possible when we live in a very real world with real frustrations, pain, and concerns? Well, Jesus, of all people, knows frustration, and he knows pain. He knows our frustrations and our pains, but he also knows the glorious rest that awaits us after this temporary, momentary experience of life. We're encouraged to set our minds on things above, and I'm reminded of one of the greatest inventions ever, the automated timer for our Christmas lights. Now, you see, I set the timer to dusk to dawn at Christmas time, and it turns itself on at the right time. It's genius, right? It's, it's perfect. We get to set our minds by engaging in communion with God at dusk and dawn to be reminded of the powerful and peace-giving promise of eternal rest we have in Jesus our Lord. So allow this truth to console you. Write this scripture out, journal about it, Listen for what the Spirit of God is saying to you today through this word and let it give you great peace as you go throughout your days here on earth. What is an estate plan and do I need it? An estate plan ensures your stuff will be distributed in the best, most tax efficient way. We plan so many other things. Why don't we plan our wills? Creating a plan for your will ensures that you have taken into account any tax implications, discussed options for the best way to pass on your stuff, thought about who would be the best executor, and considered your specific situation. 700 Club Canada has partnered with Advisors with Purpose to help you create a personal estate plan. Their services are free, confidential, and no one will sell you anything. Contact Advisors with Purpose today at plan at advisorswithpurpose.ca. When my doctor walked in, she looked at me and she said, there's something wrong with your baby's heart. Angie Sullivan was five months pregnant with her third daughter when a routine sonogram revealed baby Blair had hypoplastic left heart syndrome a rare birth defect that causes the left side of the heart to be severely underdeveloped. She called her husband, Jordan, with the news. My heart sank. I didn't like my wife crying. I didn't like the possibility of what could come from this. I just had hurt in my heart. Fear, disappointment, shock. I was in disbelief. You never want it to be you. You never want it to be your kid. Baby Blair would require several corrective surgeries at birth to survive. Angie and Jordan reached out to family and friends to pray and establish a Facebook page called Beats for Baby Blair. Without the community support, I don't know what we would have done, and I don't know if we would have had the strength to get through it without them and without their prayer. They welcomed Blair into the world on September 2nd, 2015, with a mix of hope and fear. I was soaking it all in, seeing all of her fingers and toes to see what she actually looks like in person. It was very exciting. It, it was a relief to see her, um, you know, take a breath and, and feel her on me for a moment. But it was kind of scary to see her whisk away, you know, so quickly. Blair underwent open heart surgery at eight days old. It was then that doctors made a devastating discovery. Pulmonary stenosis had disabled the healthy side of her heart, and her only chance of survival was a heart transplant. It crushed my heart. It's hard to keep your faith in a time like that, but there's not really another option. We kept praying because it's the only thing I felt like I could do to help her. Um, I wasn't able to, you know, put a Band-Aid on a skinned knee. It wasn't something I could physically help her overcome, but the only thing I could do to help Blair was to pray for her. Once again, Angie and Jordan reached out to others to pray, including Blair's 13,000 Facebook followers. Because of Blair's special circumstances, their prayers were tempered with humility. You realize that for her to get a new heart, it means that another baby dies. You don't want to pray for that. And so we would just pray that his will be done and that, you know, whatever that be, we would be prepared for it. Because of infections and other complications, Blair was taken off the transplant list multiple times over the next several months. But then on Valentine's Day, the same day Blair was put back on the list, Angie and Jordan received a phone call. 
the lady on the phone says, we've accepted a heart for Bel Air. And uh, we were like, say it again, what? And she's like, we've, we've accepted a heart for Blair. I was actually in disbelief. I actually had made our transplant coordinator repeat herself because I didn't believe her. <laughs> Both of us sank in our chairs with joy, hugged each other and cried. It was a very special Valentine's Day. And I told my wife that night before we go to bed, I was like, this is a, this is a Valentine's Day. I'll never be able to uh, beat. There's no flowers, no gifts that would uh, top, you know, giving our daughter a heart. The next day, Blair underwent a successful transplant surgery. After seven months in the hospital, she was finally released and welcomed home by a community parade. It was amazing. Finally bring her home and it felt, it felt right. It felt like this is where she needs to be. She's so upbeat, such a happy baby, um, rolling around, setting up, playing with all of her toys. She just always has a smile. Um, she's just a happy, happy baby. Blair has some catching up to do, but is expected to be on track developmentally by age four. And now each Valentine's Day, her parents are reminded of the love of God and the prayers of the faithful as they celebrate the day their little girl was given a brand new heart. Angie and I both believe if it weren't for the prayers of us, our family and, this, and our community, um, and all the people that followed us all over the world that we wouldn't have Blair home today. This is her purpose, is to share her story and to give other people hope and to give other people strength and to give other people faith. You definitely never give up faith and you just, you pray. And there's nothing else to do, you pray. Well, I can appreciate in a journey like that, that it would be easy to give up faith, but what an encouragement to see them lean into this difficult time and invite others to pray with them. That kept their faith going. That's often the key. And there's so much joy for their family on Valentine's Day, right? She gets a new heart. It truly was a miracle. You know, the heart is the organ that brings life to the human body. Without a heart, we'd be dead. And scripture says that we actually all need a new heart spiritually. We need to be brought back to life. God provides us with a new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, it says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You see, this is God's heart surgery. <laughs> he gives us a new heart. He gives us a new spirit. He takes us from death spiritually to alive spiritually. This is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit who comes and lives inside of us when we believe and accept what Jesus has done for us. This is a work of salvation. You are brought back to life. Do you need a new heart? Do you need to be revived spiritually? Have you put your, it, maybe your faith is dead. Maybe your faith is just really weak right now. I want to encourage you to just open your hands right now with me and simply pray this, Lord, I want a new heart. I welcome your spirit within me. I thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. I receive your gift of love. Come and take control of my life and grow my faith in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you call us right now so we can encourage you at 1-855-759-0700 and give you a resource called A New Day because it's a new day for you. You have a new heart and a new spirit within you. Well, up next, you'll hear how gratitude helped one man endure more than 34 years in prison. Wow. In whatever circumstance you face, God wants you to have victory. It's not too late. Believe that God wants to do a miracle in your life. And if you need to talk with someone who understands, all you have to do is call us at 1-855-759-0700. A prayer partner is waiting to listen and pray with you today. I was incarcerated in a state prison in Pennsylvania, serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole for a homicide that my cousin committed while we were out drinking one night. I was 17 years old, he was 24. I had no business being out. I had spent about 10 years at the state correctional institution in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, before I was invited to come and listen to a, a prison revival message about Jesus in the gospel. 
and I was lost. I was caught up in the drugs, I was caught up in a pornography, I was caught up in a lot of darkness. I heard the message, Jesus died and rose again, and in him there's eternal life, and real men make commitments. And I went up front and I got on my knees, and they led me through a sinner prayer. When I had served 11 years in on my life sentence, I was denied commutation by the governor's board, and it hurt, and I remember going back to my cell. The verse that I had been reading for a few years was Thessalonians 5, 17, and 18. And it says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks to God in Christ Jesus, for this is the will of God in him concerning you. And I thought, giving thanks when things are going good is what we do, and it is what most people do. But when things aren't going that well, when circumstances aren't to our benefit, will we give thanks? When I had 12 years in a prison system, I was denied again. When I had 17 years in a prison system, I went up again and I was denied. When I had 24 years in, I went up again and I was denied. 30 years in a system, I went up again and I waited two and a half years. It seemed like the longest time of my life. And I remember uh, receiving the response from the governor's office, it was denial. And I remember feeling it felt like a blow in my stomach and I, I just tried to hold myself together. And I began to listen to the Holy Spirit tell me, I want you to go back to your cell, get on your knees, and give me thanks. And it, believe me, it was probably the last thing I wanted to do. And when I began to say thank you out loud, these three things came to my mind. I, I began thanking him for protecting me. I began saying thank you for providing for me and thank you for promoting me. I heard the Lord say, I'm gonna release you, but it's not gonna be based on your effort. Fast track forward, two years later, I found myself back into court. The judge released me on April 3rd of 2012. The judge released me saying that I had spent 25 years over any sentence that I should have received as a 17 year old, spending 34 years, nine months and 15 days. I was released and I went home with my sister. About a week later, I asked my sister to call the courthouse and if I can go back and thank everybody. And I remember sitting in the courtroom with about 20 of the, the staff and I remember thanking them for everything they've ever done for me over the past 20 months that it took for my release. And it was so humbling. And I thought, you know, I have a message for my peers. I have a message for everybody is to be grateful because that's God's will for our lives. God loves when you say thank you. You can begin to give God thanks and you watch him come into that situation just as he did for me. I'm Stacey Campbell on behalf of Prison Fellowship Canada, and I want to say a personal thank you to you for partnering with the 700 Club Canada. Because of our work together, we are reaching thousands of children with the gospel, and over 30% of those children come from First Nation communities. We are connecting them with their incarcerated parent, a mom or dad, across Canada, and we just want to thank you for your partnership in that work, and God bless. Well, isn't that great news of what we can do together? You know, we have a wonderful new resource. It's a brand new book from Pat Robertson called The Power of the Holy Spirit in You, which helps you find purpose and direction in every season of your life. And it answers questions like, who is the Holy Spirit and what is his role? I want to give this to you, but I'm asking you to do something. Would you join us? Would you become a partner with us? It's as simple as calling 1-855-759-0700. You can start at $20 a month or more, whatever you feel led to do. But why don't you partner with us today and let's uh, spread this good news of Jesus across our nation. Give us a call. As I wrote this book, I felt that I was personally on the edge of something so enormously wonderful. It should be made available to everyone who has been filled with the spirit of the living God. CBN presents The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. 
a new book by Pat Robertson. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing is impossible to us. In this powerful book, Pat illuminates the work of the Holy Spirit throughout the Bible and reveals how the Spirit is working in believers today. I marvel at the strength God gives His people when we realize that the Spirit of God will go like a mighty warrior before us and that none of our enemies can stand against us. Get Pat's book and discover how you can have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Call now. I've been really reminded today of the power of love and love in the middle of difficulties, in the middle of suffering, in the middle of challenges. I mean, isn't that the history even of Valentine's Day? I mean, it really wasn't a pretty story, was it? I found that history so fascinating. And just a reminder that we're called to a life of unconditional love. So my challenge to you today is don't just look to be loved look for ways that you can love others. It's the best way to live. And I know that that's what the Lord asks of us, and it brings great joy uh, in our life when we can do that. Here's some prayer requests. I wanna spend a few minutes just praying for you. Sienna said, Lord, please heal my dad quickly. He lost his wife. Please let him go through the stages of grief fast. And Sharon said, please pray for our granddaughter. She and her husband have had two miscarriages this past year. She's pregnant again now. Well, that's wonderful news for, um, for your granddaughter, Sharon. But let's pause right now. Would you stand in agreement with me? Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you and just a reminder today that we're called to live lives of love. It's hard to do, though, on our own. So we need your strength. Thank you for your example to us. Thank you for you, Holy Spirit, who live within us and enable us to love even when we find it difficult. I pray for Sienna and I pray that you would be with her dad who's lost his wife. Would you help him in this season of grief to turn to you and gently you will bring him through it. And Lord, I pray for Sharon and her granddaughter. We pray for this pregnancy now that all would go well, that this baby would come to term and Lord, that there would be a celebration of life and also comfort them in their grief, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, no matter what happens in life, we're reminded in 1 Peter 4, verse 13, but rejoice, rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. That's like saying, you know what? Choose joy now because when all things are worked out, it's gonna be so much joy, we won't be able to contain it. So choose joy today, choose love today, and thanks for choosing to join us. We love you. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada, an invitation from a friend helps a young man escape his double life and a judge's mercy allows one mother to reunite with her four children.